Tom Shaw, um, and today I'm going to be going through with Stefan Bowman, uh, the Containers for Science train track talk. Um, but before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're situated, um, which for here us in, uh, in St. Lucia is the Turbal and Yugara people. Um, so today we will be going through uh, containers. What are they? Why are they useful? How to use them and how to build them. If my slide will advance. Which it will, great. Um, so, as I said, my name is Tom Shaw. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Advanced Imaging, um, which is here. Uh, and those are my handles if you want to contact me at any point. And my name is Stefan Bollmann. I'm a, a National Imaging Facility Fellow at the Center for Advanced Imaging. Uh, and we, if you have questions, you can ask them in the MetaMost channel and uh, also in the Jitsi room. So um, let's get started. What, what are containers? Um, so just to get started, I thought we'll prepare a little poll. Um, first, uh, are containers uh, a different name for simply a virtual machine? Or B, are they plastic boxes to store food in and keep it separated? Or are they a collection of tools to keep programs from interfering with each other? So um, as you probably guess, um, it's Containers are very much related to what, what virtual machines try to do. So I think I will show a little bit about that later. And uh, yes, it's, op it's um, obvious they're not plastic boxes to store food in. Um, yes, so they're actually a collection of tools to keep programs from interfering with each other. So what, what does that mean? So let's look a bit into this. So containers are meant to isolate software from its surrounding operating system. And container images include code, uh, the runtime, system tools, system libraries, all the settings. And we can store this image and we can distribute this to our computers. And then we also have something uh, that's called resource management and it's provided by the Linux kernel. And um, the technical concepts are namespaces and C groups, but we will not go into more detail. But basically what they allow us, they allow us to run like a little virtual machine on, on, a, on, a, on a computer. And uh, just for terminology, uh, when we talk about an image, what we mean is um, an image describes everything we need to run. So these are basically the files of this little computer that we're building. And uh, a container is the instance of that. So when we are launching uh, a, little, a little container, then we are basing it on the image and we're starting it. And then we get software in there. So I hope this will become uh, a lot clearer, but just to explain what are the technologies out there to do this. So the first big one was Docker. Um, Docker started the container hype and it basically made tools that were already available in Linux, made them really nice and user friendly. And it provided packages to do this on Linux, Windows and Mac. And um, it's widely adopted because when the cloud uh, basically took off, it was really useful to package software in containers to be able to shift these containers quickly around on different computers and different data centers and different places in the world. Um, and also when you, when you read about Docker, there's something like Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is, uh, is an orchestration tool. So you can manage all these little containers. So they call them microservices. And um, in, in science, you will not deal uh, so much with Kubernetes. But um, what's the problem with Docker for us? We run a lot of graphical applications, right? So we need FSL view uh, and, and MR view, all these, all these little tools. Uh, and that's not so easy with Docker. And uh, Docker requires uh, elevated privileges, so root privileges. And that's why there was a, a different tool uh, for the scientific community. Uh, the tool is called Singularity. It's very similar to Docker, does basically the same thing. Um, but it's, it's simple to install. It's, it runs on high performance computing systems, but it allows something very nice. It allows to run untrusted users running untrusted containers, which means that you're the same user inside the image than outside. And because of this, you can run it in a shared environment, which you can't do with Docker. And also Singularity is built for data science. So GPU is much easier to, to work with. Graphical applications are very easy to work with. You don't have to do any wizardy to do this. And we'll show later how to, how to do this. And also, um, 
the container format of Singularity is a little bit nicer for, for us scientists because it's just a single file. So we can easily move this file to different computers. We can archive this file with the data that we have, for example, and can, can keep uh, the, the environment that we analyze the data with the data, which is a fantastic feature. And um, yeah, that's enabled by Singularity. Um, Next slide. Okay, here it is. Oh, okay. I was too fast. Oh. Sorry, the slides are a little bit uh, delayed for me. So, um, what is, because I already mentioned, containers are something like a virtual machine. So, what's the difference between a virtual machine and a container? So, we'll start at the hardware. So, we have a workstation, for example, a Dell Precision but it could also be our notebook, it could be our MacBook, it could be, um, it could be also a high performance computing system. Um, on, on top of that, we have usually an operating system. So in, the, in this case, I just said CentOS 6 or Ubuntu or something else. And then in the old days, so before containers, what we did is we installed a hypervisor, for example, VirtualBox. In this hypervisor, we installed a guest operating system. So one example, Ubuntu 16.04. And then in this whole guest operating system, we installed the libraries that we need to run, for example, Qt4 to run graphical applications. And on top of that, we installed our, our application, for example, IPK Snap. And then we were able to give this whole virtual machine to someone and they could just run our analysis. The problem of this is it takes a lot of storage because you need to install the whole operating system. You need to install everything, uh, even stuff you don't need. Um, and also, you pay with performance because these virtual hypervisor systems in the beginning, they emulated hardware. So you were actually not directly running on the hardware below. You are actually adding another layer in between. And that made things pretty slow and not good for, for computing, really. Today, um, the hypervisors got a lot better. So virtual machines are, uh, are, are better today, but still, they require a lot of storage. Also, they require a long startup time. So because you have all the stuff in there, it takes 15, 30 seconds to start a virtual machine, which is not great. And because you have a lot of stuff in there, you need a lot of memory. So if you just think about you want to launch IDK Snap and you have to wait 15 seconds and it takes 10 gigabyte of an image file, that's just too big. And that's why containers try to solve this and make this a much slimmer thing. So uh, you still start on the hardware, you have your operating system, but then you have this, this Docker daemon. And what Docker does is, it tries to reuse a lot of the things that are in the operating system below. And it, you only add the stuff that you don't have in your container, um, also the libraries you don't have, and then the application. And because you only add the stuff that you, that you don't have yet, you end up with a much smaller image, so 0.1 gigabyte, for example, for this ITK snap image. Also, because you don't have any other stuff, it's very fast. You end up with a, with a 0.2 second startup time. So it feels like you have this, this application installed because there's nothing booting. There's no operating system. You're using the operating system that you're already on. And because of this, you, you don't need a lot of memory. So it's great if you want to analyze data. Um, you're actually not uh, consuming more, more hardware than you need. So that's what the difference between virtual machines and containers are. And I hope this now makes a little bit clearer what containers are. And you can already see, hopefully, some applications. But before we move on, uh, are there any questions? So since this is a recording, uh, there might not be that many questions, <laughs> except Tom has a question. Uh, no, no questions here, I don't think. Um, OK, that was, that was all good. <laughs> awesome, cool. Well, then I hand over to Tom, and he will take you through uh, some more things. Great. Um, so, uh, so the next part that we're going to be talking about today is why are containers useful? Um, and I'm just going to give you, a, uh, from a user perspective, a uh, from a neuroimaging user perspective, uh, a lot of reasons why I have found containers useful throughout um, my PhD. <clears throat> um, so the first thing that we'll talk about uh, is uh, the reproducibility crisis in neuroimaging. Um, <clears throat> so this paper here talks about uh, uh, glibc and uh, some of the problems that Linux has um, when there is an update um, in uh, these libraries that Stefan was talking about just before. Um, so what this uh, paper described was that when the version of this particular library changed, um, the floating point precision actually changed uh, within um, uh, these different functions that would be happening. 
Um, so what you can see on this slide is that it's exactly the same function, but it gives a different output. Um, now you may say, you know, this doesn't make too much of a difference. It's just a floating point precision, you know, that's just a couple of decimal places. Um, but this adds unnecessary computational noise. Um, so uh, yes, uh, this is actually a big problem uh, within your imaging. Um, it does cause some error, uh, but sharing your pipeline um, and making it reproducible is actually very important for us. Uh, so it can lead to significant differences in, in long pipelines, as we say. Okay, um, so I'll just give a couple of use cases. Um, so for example, in my masters, I was asked to rerun a free surfer analysis from five years ago using free surfer 5.3. Um, so what would you do? You go to free surfer, you download and install. Um, free surfer, you want the different versions. So you go to the version page, um, you find 5.3, wherever it is down here somewhere. First of all, which one is it? There's five. Uh, and then you click on the one that you decide. And then you look in here, what have we got? So um, we've got one on Mac OS, uh, and we've also got one on CentOS 4 and 6. Um, the problem with these now is that some of these actually won't run anymore on some of these older systems. Or um, if you have a Mac, I mean, Mac or Apple forces you to update your system at some point, uh, and you will have to update from uh, OS Lion. So it may be impossible or very, very difficult for you to run a free surfer analysis from 5.3. Um, which is why containerization can be very, very useful. Um, free stuff of 5.3 also causes a library error, uh, which was the same library, I believe, that we were talking about before. Um, so it may be very useful for you to use containers in this example. The next use case I wanted to talk about was scalability. Um, so for example, you want to run fMRI prep uh, on your pilot data. So you've got a bunch of fMRI data, uh, this is you, uh, and this is your uh, scanner. This is Eamon, our radiographer at uh, CAI and the cell participant that we just got. Um, so we've got a pilot data and we want to run it through fMRI prep. So what happens then is that suddenly Eamon goes and scans 100 different people. Um, and we've got all of this new data that we have to include in our pipeline. Now, thankfully, um, uh, scaling with containers can make things very, very easy. Uh, because you're using exactly the same code as you did in the first uh, instance with your pilot data as you were with 100 participants. Um, so what you can do is you can use the same software on different platforms. For example, now you're using a HPC instead of your crappy laptop, um, and you're using exactly the same code, exactly the same software, and it's all containerized within, say, a Docker or Singularity uh, container, and you're running exactly the same code and the same input. Uh, which is why some of these things are so useful. So you can run the same thing um, uh, and scale it up uh, infinitely, depending on your compute system. So yes, you can run the same pipeline with no changes, hooray. Uh, the next thing, uh, running things on different operating systems. So example, you've got your, your terrible laptop here and you're not looking very happy and you go away and you spend uh, $2,000 on a brand new Alienware computer. Now what do you do? You've got a new operating system, for example. Let's say that you've changed from Mac um, over to Windows. Now what do you do? Well, um, with containers, you can run Linux software on Mac and Windows, and you can run Linux software on Linux as well, obviously. Um, but containers will make your work reproducible and robust to operating system changes. So it doesn't matter what your underlying host operating system is. Um, with containers, you can run the exact same uh, sort of light operating system on your computer that you are using and the operating system that you're using at the moment. So that really helps in the prefixes example where you go from using your local computer up to your HPC, which will usually be Linux, uh, and you don't have to change any of the code. Great. <clears throat> Our next use case is sharing. So here you are, you want to share with all of your friends. Uh, next thing, um, so uh, in this example here is a, a paper that we recently published looking at um, segmentation of the hippocampus subfields. Uh, and what we wanted to do was actually share our pipeline, our analysis, our software, and our code, and all of our data um, all at the same time. <clears throat> and so one way of doing this uh, is via Singularity and Docker through containers. So what we could do here is actually publish an instance of our code, of our software that we use, the operating system that we used, uh, and also all of the data push it all into a single container, and then anybody who wants to use it uh, can now uh, reproduce the entire pipeline, including the data and including the code and including the software at the moment that it was run. 
uh, and uh, reproduce it exactly, which is a very, very powerful tool uh, in the time of this sort of so-called reproducibility crisis. Okay, so what are some benefits of containers? Uh, so longitudinal stability of software we've already talked about. So for example, upgrading Ubuntu uh, 16.04 breaks FSL view, which is why they developed um, FSLIs or fossilize. Um, reproducible. In my previous example with uh, the reproducing all of the code and the software, um, if I go in and change my uh, image, for example, if I change one of the um, underlying software packages, um, it's not, it's no longer reproducible. So yes, um, containers can be reproducible, but if you change something about the container, uh, it's no longer reproducible. As Stefan has mentioned, uh, containers are portable. Uh, which is great, and they are isolated, so they're not exposed to the host system. Uh, on top of that, they're quite easy to use. Um, so the example that I will give here is that if anybody here has tried to install ANTS, Advanced Normalization Tools, um, on the HPC or anywhere for that matter, uh, it can be quite tricky um, without pseudo access. Um, when you're doing, uh, when you're using containers, and particularly when you're using things like NeuroDocker, which we'll be talking about a bit later in the talk, um, it can be very, very easy to use and install software uh, in a container. Uh, on top of that, some software is actually easier to use in containers. For example, fMRI prep, MRI QC, and the BIDS apps uh, and their integration can actually be very, very easy to use um, in containers because there are all of these, uh, all of this documentation that surrounds using it in uh, the container. And if anybody's seen the fMRI prep website, or any of the BIDS apps, uh, websites, they would know that a lot of it runs really, really well uh, within the container rather than having to install SPM, AFNI, ANT, FreeSurfer, uh, and all of the other Python tools that surround it, uh, NiPipe as well, for example. So it can be really, really easy to use in these examples. So um, what are some challenges or some headaches um, that you can have? Uh, it can be hard to use at times, so it's, it's a steep learning curve. Um, and we will kind of see that in this talk. Uh, the syntax of the commands can be quite difficult as well. Uh, Docker generally won't work with high performance computing systems. So if you have a HPC at your university, um, Docker generally won't be on there. <clears throat> um, as I said before, versioning of containers comes with no guarantees. Uh, images may just disappear if I decide to remove my own image from my analysis pipeline. It's just gone and that's, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, things can just disappear or change. There are also licensing issues. So um, as many of you would know, for FreeSurf, you need a license file uh, in order to run it. The same with FSL, you need to actually sign uh, a license in order to use it. MATLAB um, as well is also proprietary software and the license is very expensive. You can run the MATLAB runtime within containers, uh, but again, it does need a license um, for these other programs. The other challenge is, uh, mostly that it is a black box. So you don't really know what's inside the container when you use it. You can build a singularity or um, Docker container on your computer and have no idea where it, come where it came from, who made it, or what's inside of it. Um, so it's always good to check. Uh, and as we said before, the version of singularity and Docker changes as well. Okay, um, so if there are any questions at this point, I would say not um, because we're in the talk. So. Um, we'll just kind of continue on <clears throat> and say, uh, how can we use containers? So in this section of the talk, um, we're going to be using the BIDS um, data structure, so brain imaging data structure, which you should be familiar by now if you're in the train track sessions. Uh, there was a BIDS talk, I believe. Um, so BIDS, just quickly, and BIDS apps, uh, neuro, neuro imaging tools and workflows uh, in Docker containers, for example, FreeSurf, SPM, etc. Uh, so all of these different um, uh, all of these different tools run on the bids data format. So if your uh, data is in bids, then you can easily run all of these tools and run all of these analysis pipelines uh, very quickly. Okay, um, so we're going to be going through how to use containers at the moment. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is uh, Hello World. So this is kind of a um, an interactive type of session. So all of the code to this will be on the HackMD um, website, uh, which we would have sent to you by email. Uh, it'll also be on the Mattermost channel. Uh, so the first one that we're going to be going through is um, 
the hello world example, which is the easiest version. So if you have Docker installed on your local computer, you can simply type this command, which is docker run hello world. Uh, and hello world uh, will show you that uh, hello from Docker, this message shows your installation appears to be working correctly. Um, so that's the simplest example of just running a Docker command. Uh, um, the next one um, that we'll be going through is just uh, that uh, Docker does cache these images. So <clears throat> what happened with the Hello World example is that Docker pulled uh, a container called Hello World uh, from Docker Hub, which is where all of these containers are, are stored. Uh, and it pulled it down into your computer. It was very, very small, only a few megabytes, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and then what it did is run a program within uh, Docker called Hello World, which printed that uh, text to your screen. Um, once you try and rerun uh, Hello World, it won't try and pull uh, that container down again. Uh, so it already knows that you have the container. So this can be very useful if you're rebuilding containers with slightly different options, because it can actually cache um, the different uh, parts of your container that are being built. Okay, if you want to show um, the images that you've downloaded, so in this case we've got um, a few different Docker images in our system. Um, here we've got an Ubuntu, uh, we've got Hello World here, which is the one that we just downloaded, uh, and it's not even megabytes, it's a few kilobytes even. Um, so what can end up happening is that it can fill up your computer quite quickly, um, and you can remove these, <coughs> pardon me, uh, you can remove these images if you want to. <coughs> so in order to remove them, um, you can just use a command like docker uh, rmi, which is remove image, um, and you can actually remove uh, that hello world example that we we're just looking at before. So our hello world one here, um, docker remove uh, force is minus f, Hello world, and what we end up doing is deleting that uh, that image from our computer. And then, if you want to re-download it, you just run Docker run or Docker pull, the same as before. Okay, so now what we can see here is that that image is now gone. So it used to be down here, and now it's gone from our system. Okay, uh, so the next one, which I would say is probably the most um, practical or useful example that. Uh, most of you will want to use uh, is using fMRI prep. So as many of you will be aware, fMRI prep is a general purpose uh, pre-processing pipeline that uses uh, for fMRI data that uses um, the best parts of uh, many different tools. Um, maybe saying the best parts isn't a great way of saying it, um, but good parts from uh, many different tools in order to make a sort of standardized pre-processing pipeline for fMRI data. Um, so these are all of the different steps that are performed within uh, um, fMRI prep, um, which includes uh, outputting some confounds at the end, uh, storing nuisance regresses. It's got uh, the works. It's got everything in it. It's got free surfer reconstruction if you want that. It's got AFNI. It's got um, spatial normalization using SPM. Um, it has everything. So there's about six or seven different software programs that are actually used within fMRI prep. Now, if you wanted to use this normally, you would need to have FreeSurfer, SPM, MATLAB, uh, AFNI, you would need to have all of these different NiPipe um, dependencies uh, installed as well. But with containers, uh, they contain all of that software and all of the necessary components for it within a single uh, image, which uh, can then be run, um, which is quite powerful. So let's go through a quick example of how to run a uh, Docker image of fMRI prep or a Docker container uh, for fMRI prep. So the first thing that you would need to do is of course download um, the container. And if you'd like to go to the fMRI, web, uh, fMRI prep website, you can see how to do that. But it's simply just uh, Docker pull, uh, pull direct lab fMRI prep latest, uh, and that will pull the container for you. So the main command um, to kind of understand here is that you need to use Docker run. Uh, and that's uh, the main thing that we'll be going through today is running the Docker image uh, and including all of the different variables that you need uh, in order to make fMRI prep run. Um, so we won't be going through all of these different variables today because we wanna keep it nice and simple. But if you do have any questions about um, what the different variables mean, uh, how they work and how they interact with the container and the operating system, uh, please ask on the Jitsi room or on the Zoom channel here. 
uh, on any of the MetaMost channels as well. We're also on the help desk. Um, you can see here that this is the name of the container. So after we've put a few of our different variables, we, we put the name of the container. Uh, and then these are the different parameters that you'd need to make fMRI prep run. So these ones here, for example, that's our data directory, our out directory, for example, and our work directory. Once we hit run and once we hit enter, uh, what fMRI prep will do uh, is actually run through the bids validator first to make sure our data is in bids, um, tell us a little summary of everything that's going on, and then it will start running fMRI prep version 20. So um, what we can see here is that it's running um, free surface subjects directory is here. Um, and the really interesting thing here is that if I then kill this job and go outside of the container, um, and I try and run recon all outside of the container, um, I'll get an error thrown. Uh, recon all, of course, being the reconstruct pipeline from FreeSurfer. Um, so you can see that recon all isn't on my path and it isn't um, held anywhere within my computer, uh, but it is within the container. So that means that I can run uh, recon all and FreeSurfer from within the container, but I can't do it from without the, without the container. Okay, um, so our next example here is uh, pulling the image to a HPC, so a high-performance computer. So here you are sharing all of your results from project uh, to your friends um, after you've run all of that data on the HPC. So our next example, we've done our one um, participant, and now we want to do 100 participants on uh, fMRI prep with our HPC to impress your boss. So Docker doesn't run, first of all, because um, HPCs don't allow us to use Docker. So what we need to use is Singularity. Um, or we could install all of the software, uh, which would just be dependency hell, basically. Um, so what we want to do here is push, um, well, we can do one of two things here. We can either push our Docker image that we've just made to our Docker Hub and pull it on the HPC using Singularity. So you can run the, the software without root access. Or we can just pull the image directly from Docker Hub. Um, and in this case, because we're using fMRI prep, uh, what we're going to do is just build the image directly from Docker Hub using Singularity. So this may seem a little bit confusing at this point, um, and uh, we kind of recognize that. So if you do get kind of mixed up between these two things, just kind of think about Singularity as the one that you're going to be using on the HPCs, and Docker is the one that you can use locally. Um, and generally what I've found in my experience anyway is that I mostly use Singularity uh, these days anyway, because you can build Docker images from Singularity. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So what we're doing is building a Singularity image, which we're going to be calling uh, fMRI prep latest singularity image. And we're going to be building that from this website. And what we can see is that's just telling us that it's Docker Hub, uh, Poldrick Lab, fMRI prep, and latest. And then with that single command, um, after we've made our images directory, uh, it will start the build and it will copy all of these different things. Uh, and we don't really need to worry about all of this different stuff that's happening. Um, but at the end of it, it will actually complete the build uh, with a file called fMRI prep latest singularity image. And that singularity image can be used in basically the same way as our Docker image from the last step. It can be used to run fMRI prep. So, now we can actually do fMRI prep on the HPCs using Singularity, um, which is really, really powerful because now we can parallelize our jobs across hundreds of nodes uh, or whatever your system is on your HPC. Great. Um, so I think that's a good place for a pause, um, but we're going to be going on now um, to uh, what a simple Docker container kind of looks like. Um, so this next part uh, of the talk, uh, we're going to be going through how to actually make your own Docker containers. So um, if you're fine with just uh, using Docker and Singularity um, for fMRI prep or other bids apps, uh, this would be kind of the advanced section of the talk. Um, but for those of you who want to do your own things and put your own software uh, into your own Docker containers and Singularity containers, uh, this is the section for you. Okay. Um, so these uh, slides and these uh, code are all on the GitHub and also the HackMD site. So if you do get a bit lost, you can go through all of the code. Uh, it is a little bit um, 
it can be a bit difficult to look through, but it's also all commented. And again, if you do have questions, feel free to ask us. So what we can see here is that this is VS Code. Um, and when we do create a Docker file, which we just call Docker file, a cute little Docker whale appears as well. So we know that we've got a Docker image. Um, and this is our headachey Docker file. Um, so, oh, we've got a headache. <laughs> so uh, for this, I'm not going to go through the syntax of how to create your own Docker image. Um, but what you do need to understand is that uh, in order to make a Docker file, it needs to have the Docker format. It needs to have all of the different um, uh, things that you want to include in your Docker image in different lines, uh, on single lines even as well. Um, and the syntax is all kind of readily available online if you want to have a look through how to create your own. We've got some examples um, on the GitHub as well. Um, and we're going to be showing you how to simplify this uh, with NeuroDocker uh, in just a moment. So for the moment, uh, this is kind of the structure of a Docker file. Um, and what you want to do is you want to build that Docker file, right? So um, you want to create your own Docker image now after you've decided what type of software you want to put in it. So in our example on HackMD, what we use is ITK Snap. Um, but uh, in this example here, we're not going to go through exactly how we're doing it. But the point that we make here is that um, we have this folder, which is called build ITK snap docker, which contains that docker file, which is here. So we can see uh, build ITK snap docker and the docker file lives within that, that container. Sorry, within that directory. Uh, and what we want to do is in its simplest invocation, uh, just use docker build and point, the, point to the directory that contains the docker file. And uh, this may all just look like garbage, but it's actually building each step, which is each line uh, from that Docker file. And it's doing it one by one and using the case for each time because we're in, the in this case. Okay. Um, so now that we've built our Docker container, um, and there are plenty of examples of how you can create your own Docker container, so we, we probably won't go into that in too much detail. Um, but what we're going to try and do now is actually use the Docker container interactively. So we're going to go into the container. Um, so we're entering the matrix here, guys. Um, what we're going to do here is uh, run a graphical application, um, which does require some wizardry using um, Docker. But we're just going to keep things simple um, and actually run the Docker container interactively by going inside of it. So what we can do now is actually enter inside um, the Docker container. So what we can see here is that we're sitting within my um, C users Thomas um, file, and then we go inside of the container, which is called uh, ITK snap, and that's the name of the container. Um, then we're inside of the container here in the next line. And then what we can do is simply run the command that we normally would after uh, exporting our display variable. But don't worry about that too much. Uh, and uh, what we can find here is that when we run ITK snap from inside the container, um, we get an us, well, basically we can, uh, we can run ITK snap uh, and it's a graphical application. So this is really cool because I don't have ITK snap installed on my computer, but it is installed within the container. So then I can view images um, by using the container quite um, successfully. Yay. Uh, this would be another question slide. So if anybody has any questions at this point, um, I know that was probably a hard one to get through, um, but if you do have any questions, let us know. Okay, for those of you who tuned out because that was all too difficult, we're gonna make it nice and simple for you now. Um, so what we'd like to do now is uh, distribute the pipeline that we've made um, or distribute our own software and do something a little bit more advanced, but uh, use uh, simple tools. So we don't wanna actually create our own Docker well, we do want to create our own Docker container, but we don't want to have to write our own Docker definitions file uh, for everything. So NeuroDocker is a project that helps um, uh, building imaging pipelines in Docker uh, and by using um, uh, this project called RepoNim, uh, Reproducible Neuroimaging. Um, so what we want to do here is um, basically create our own Docker and Singularity definition files so that we can create uh, our own um, software pipelines uh, very, very easily. So this is just a screenshot from the uh, NeuroDocker website. And what we can see here is that there's all of these different software packages that we can use. 
uh, and actually install in, within a Docker or Singularity container. So we've got SPM, NeuroDBN, MRTrix, FSL, FreeSurfer, all the rest of it. There's also NiPipe in there too. So using just a few simple commands with NeuroDocker, we can actually make our own Docker files and Singularity um, definition files uh, in order to create our own bespoke uh, NeuroDocker, uh, sorry, Docker and Singularity images, which is really, really cool. So for those of you who just want to make um, a Singularity image with FreeSurfer and uh, FSL on it so that they can do recon all, this is the part which is probably the most important bit. So here's what a, um, let's say we want to look at some images of brains. Uh, so we're going to generate a Singularity recipe using NeuroDocker. And the exact um, commands for how to do this are again on the HackMD website. Don't worry about this, this is the output, but this is the input. So this is all we had to do in order to make all of this. So it's a NeuroDocker generate, um, and we want to make a Singularity image. And what we might do here is, uh, sorry, is define uh, the software that we wanted to use. So for example, in, uh, in this case here, we wanted to use ITK Snap version 3.8, uh, and then do a bunch of other stuff that might be important for making ITK Snap run. But here, um, NeuroDocker actually makes it really simple to create these types of um, definition files. So what's happened here is that with all of this, um, or this short few lines of code, we've created all of this um, singularity definition file. And we can make a Docker, um, Docker file as well so that we can build our own Docker files uh, from NeuroDocker very, very easily with just a few lines of code. So for those of you who are just looking to make a really simple um, Docker file or a really simple um, singularity file, NeuroDocker is really a good place to start. Okay. Um, so the last couple of things that we're just going to go through today are um, building Singularity containers as well. Uh, so let's say that we just created our NeuroDocker image um, that has a uh, free surfer on it, for example. We want to now use that free surfer container on the HPC. Um, so what we can do now is actually build that, uh, that container on the HPC itself uh, using the latest versions of Singularity. And what you actually do is build the container online and then pull it down uh, into the HPC. So with just a few lines of code here, um, what we can do uh, is take that singularity file that we have uh, created from, uh, from NeuroDocker and use it on a high performance computer or even on your own computer and build it um, remotely, which is quite useful uh, if you want to uh, make your own analysis pipelines with different uh, bits of software from all over the place, or even your own software and your own data. Um, and you can build it all uh, online. Cool. Um, so what you'd have to do is just follow along with the code um, that we've put online, uh, but basically remote login to Singularity, um, create this uh, you know, API keys, what it says here, just follow the instructions, it's super simple. Um, and then what you can do is build your image um, using the Singularity uh, ITK Snap uh, Singularity definition file that you made with um, NeuroDocker. So your steps here would be create the NeuroDocker um, Singularity definition file uh, and then build it remotely on the HPC and then you're good to go. You've got your Singularity image that you can use uh, and it's got all of the different software that you required um, thanks to NeuroDocker. So it should be a um, fairly straightforward process. And uh, yeah, if you do have any questions, of course, let us know. Can I add two little things uh, to this? Yeah. If you quickly go back, I just wanted to, uh, we don't have it in the slides, but um, there's, there's two th uh, comments I want to make. So the first one is, ITK Snap, uh, we, we added this to, to NeuroDocker for, for this example. So if you're running NeuroDocker playing from the repository, ITK Snap might not yet be in there because it might not have been merged. So if you run into an error, the problem is uh, we, we added that. Uh, the second thing is this remote building, as Tom said, is really, really cool. I ran into one problem yesterday uh, where it said uh, there's not enough storage available. And the thing is, if you have this problem, there's, you can only build an image that's 11 gigabyte in size. So if you store images in your, in your Singularity library online, 
and your library is basically already full, you can't build a new image. So it will not tell you that this is the problem. It will just tell, oh, you, you, you don't have image. You don't have any space for a new image. So I just wanted to say that because I noticed that yesterday, so we hadn't added to the slides, but <laughs> I thought it's, a, it's an interesting one. So the image can only be under 11 gigabytes or 11 Correct. gigabytes in total. Ah, okay. So exactly, so every image, exactly the maximum size of an image is 11 gigabyte. And then if you store, if you keep your images in this library, you decrease this thing. So I had built multiple images and I basically was filling up my storage online. And I, I, I didn't know that I have to delete them if I want more space. So I thought probably people run into the same problems. So I just mentioned it. Definitely people will run into the same and many other problems, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, so yes, here we are happy that we've got our singularity image. Uh, at this point, there'd be more questions, um, but we'll just move on. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Stefan at this point, who will be talking about transparent singularity. Yeah, so that's basically now, if, if that was the advanced part, now we're going into a bit the, the geeky part. So the, when we started using singularity for our analysis, we wondered, okay, do I now always have to type singularity, exec, ITK snap, something, something, ITK snap, because that's, I, I hate typing personally. So we thought, no, we, we should make something that makes this easier. So Tom and I were thinking about it and we came up with a, let's just build a tool that automatically writes wrapper scripts around it. So that basically it, it ends up that uh, you don't even, you don't even have to type all the singularity stuff around it. So you just type IDK snap and it just works. So that was the goal. And that's how this project was born. Uh, and we call it transparent singularity because um, ID, uh, it, you, you feel that, trans, that singularity is not even there. It just makes your stuff work on the HPC. Um, so how, how does it work? So we'll just show a quick example. So in order to have it to work, you need to clone the transparent singularity uh, repository and then you already give it a folder name so I'm just taking example FNE 20.106 so it will create will pull that thing will create a folder then you CD into this folder and then you can run the script so we call it run transparent singularity and then as the argument you give it the, the container name so there is a list of containers that we have made available uh, already, but you can also just add your own container there. You just need to, uh, you build your singularity file and you put it there and then you just call that name and then it will not try to pull it from our registry, but it will just use your local container. So, um, and when you run it, what it will say is I'm installing the container uh, into your system and uh, for this stuff to work, you have to set up bind paths. So we described this in the repository, but uh, after doing this, it will be really easy to use. So what it has done now is it has created for every binary that's on a certain path. So that's why we had in the recipe that we showed earlier, we had this variable that we call it deploy path. So we, we introduced that in order to make transparent singularity work. So it basically looks at the deploy path and you can have multiple deploy paths. It will look for, for executables inside the image. And what it will do is it will automatically create a shell script for every executable in the image. So, and these, these wrapper scripts are very simple. They will basically say, okay, I want to work in the current directory and I want to call singularity. I want to execute this. I want to work in my current directory. Then I want to call a certain container and then I want to call a certain command in there. And I want to pass on all arguments that I gave this thing. So, in also, also what we do in addition is we create a module. So lots of HPCs use the LMOD module system. And um, when you then hit module avail and you have your module path set up to the, to the folder where we create these modules, you see suddenly, oh, now I have FNE and FreeSurfer in your module system. So you can extend your own HPC with your own modules and everything runs from inside the containers. Um, so the beauty of it is it now when you run module load FNE, you get FNE on your path and then you don't have to type singularity or anything. You just type SUMA and the viewer of FNE will just open. And if you're lucky, it will show you Humor Simpson. Uh, if not, it will just show you a plane or, uh, or other things. So it always starts with random thing, but it shows that we can run graphical applications. Uh, again, we actually logged in remotely into HPC and we just have mobile apps and which provides a local X, uh, an X server. And we can actually render stuff uh, on, on our Windows system. 
And now we can just continue using Nightpipe without actually changing anything in Nightpipe because it feels for Nightpipe like if, if these tools would be installed natively. And because we combine with the module system, you always are in control of what containers you want on your path and what you don't. So we, we're using this since I think two years now and we're, we're pretty happy with it. And uh, for us, it just made our life a lot easier because what this basically allows you to do is you can start with your analysis locally on your computer then you move to a bigger workstation, then you upgrade your workstation and then you move to different HPCs um, and everything is very, um, very movable, very portable. And um, this is pretty much what we had planned for today. So I've, I think we thank everyone for their attention. And now we're looking forward to questions in the question and answer. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, we are live and I'm inviting, uh, as far as I can see, Stefano and please say hi to the chat so I, it will be easy to, for me to find you and invite you. Hey, we are live and I'm inviting. And I'm hearing uh, myself at another as browser. As far as I can see, Stefano and please say hi to the chat so I, it will be easy to find Okay. Hey, I can. It's creepy to hear you from other computer. So I just invited Tom and Remy. Yep. I just noticed one question and I copied it and I, I know it's answered. Um, but if there are other questions, feel free to ask me again. Hey. I think we can invite everyone on stage. I mean, uh, Stefan and and Tom, because uh, I've uh, I want to talk to them live. That's they are much. accepted and connecting. You were cool. the awesome. Hello, Tom. Hey. Hi. How are you doing? Good. And you? Can, can you hear me? Very good. We can hear you. Fantastic. Oh, okay. Um, I can't hear you, so I need to check my <laughs> sound settings. Oh. <clears throat> It's the first time crowdcast for me, so. Yeah, yeah. first time experience to be like, you're a bit like you lose your, just what is going on here? Okay, good. My browser found my headphones. So, okay, I'm good. If cool. you can hear me, so you I can, can hear you. you. Yeah, we can totally hear you. Good, awesome. good, good. Um, so uh, how is crowdcast? Uh, it's good, yes. Uh, the, the, Steam, the, the stream uh, broke for me halfway a few times, so I had to restart oh. my browser, but then it was working, so. Okay, yeah. that, is, that is interesting. Uh, not sure that happened before. Um, what did I want to say? So if people have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I think uh, one way we can also do this is that um, I can, for example, just leave my space on a Crowdcast uh, screen and then someone can come and ask the question live. Um, uh, otherwise, we can have a bit of a, of a, of, of a chat. Uh, just because how much, how are we doing in terms of time? I'm, I'm so hard for me to keep track of all the things because I'm trying to be on schedule. We are, um, good. We are good. We have got yeah, we time. Have time because the uh, earlier session, the video was shorter than expected. So we have yeah. time. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> um, I mean, right. if so no one has... Go for in the Australian uh, session today, we had a lot of questions about the images in the slide. So people were asking what animals we showed. So we had, uh, I think we went a lot <laughs> oh, of overtime because we were guessing, okay, that's a barking owl and that was a rock, uh, a swamp wallaby and things. So if people yeah. want to ask questions about the animals on the slides, you're very welcome. Yeah, actually I was right before coming here, I was with uh, the rest of your, your team uh, in Gathered Town chatting with them and they were asking where's the wallaby from or something like this. And I had no idea, but apparently that's that's one of the questions I'm supposed to just like pass on. Yes, I think it started because I was confusing a question from uh, from someone in the chat because I was asking, okay, what is an image? And because they were asking about a Docker image and I thought they were asking about the images on the slides. So oh. explaining what the animal is they're seeing, but I'm actually really interested in the Docker images. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
One uh, question is about how to build a container and how to share the receipt, as I understood. I'm really paraphrasing the question, but you answered that, I know. Uh, oh, in the previous the, chat? Yeah, at the previous chat. I had a discuss, yeah. discussion with a colleague of mine, sharing receipt versus built container. Sharing receipt is easy, quick, and lightweight, but it's a, if there's a software update and installation without specifying the version, reproducibility, reproducibility might actually be lost. What's your recommendation about it? Yeah, exactly. So we, we tried to answer it a bit in the in the chat yeah, yeah. Uh, already or in the, in the question. So it's it's tricky, exactly. It, it, I think it depends on what you want. So um, the, the recipe files, they are very easy. They're just text files. You can host them in, in Git uh, and you just uh, archive them there. But the problem is that building a container today and building a container tomorrow will result in different containers because the underlying package infrastructure will change and you will not get a bitwise reproducibility. So I think if you want reproducibility, you have no other way of uh, archiving the images in a repository and uh, in these registries. So the Docker registry does this already uh, and they provide you, I think, infinite storage. So I haven't found the, the limit hmm. on the Docker repository. Mm -hmm. uh, I found a limit on the singularity registry. So that, that was easy, 11 gigabyte. Um, but so far, and that's why we still build everything in Docker and then convert to Singularity, uh, Docker gives us the way of archiving all our images we ever build, and we can always pull them back to Singularity. And um, also another reason is Singularity changed quite a bit from 2.4 to, uh, to 3 version, um, So, but it was always able to pull Docker images. So by, by archiving all our images in Docker, we were always able to port the new containers into the new Singularity version, which was always quite helpful. Mm -hmm. A problem we have a little bit in Australia, I think it's not a problem in Europe, is the connection to the Docker library is slow ah, because it's, okay. I think it's mostly hosted in the US um, and I think they don't have a CDN in Australia yet. So I actually build up our own singularity registry here because we're pulling a lot of containers on our HPCs. And the problem is that as soon as we do off net traffic, the admins ask, what are you doing? Because uh, someone has to pay the bill in the end. Uh, so yeah. we, we basically host our images on net, so they're really fast to pull them into our different HPCs and no one has to ask us questions while we're pulling terabytes of images around. <laughs> yeah, that could be an issue in the long term, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I guess one of the questions that we had uh, in the chat in the Australian version was the difference between images, uh, recipes, and uh, containers. Um, maybe Stefan, you can talk to. We we added that in this morning as well. So um, the question was, what what are what's the difference between an image, uh, a container, and a recipe? <laughs> So, Stefan, you want to take that one? <laughs> I, I can, yes. Yes, exactly. So, the recipe uh, is, is a text file that describes, that has the, the, the things in there that tell it, oh, install that package, download this thing. So, really, the instructions for building the image. So, the result of taking the recipe file and putting through the build process is an image file. And the image file really contains the binaries that you created with this. And um, then, if you take this image and you launch it, uh, with a with a container and the singularity of Docker, then you end up with a container. So that's I think how we define these these terms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think people people understand that concept then quite easily because it can get a bit confusing with recipes and images and containers. And, yeah. yeah. So we refer to container. That's the running thing in the end. Yeah. And I I have a question because it's something I, I often get I run into. What would be your advice to minimize the size of the containers? Because sometimes they can yeah. grow pretty big. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it was addressed in the video because I've been too busy multitasking uh, to actually check. So uh, please. So seeing you edited the website, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so there, there are different ways of, of dealing with it. So I think the first one is uh, by making sure that you are chaining commands as much as possible. So basically, run everything in one line uh, because every command you put in a Docker file will create a layer, and every layer will create space. So even deleting something will create another layer, and you will actually not get rid of this layer. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, by creation, you can make already sure that you, you try to be as efficient as possible. So then there are things like uh, NeuroDocker does this very, very smartly. They have a lot mm. of things in there to save space. So they do bash no install recommends. So you don't install libraries that you don't need, for example. Mm. And they clear caches during building. You can do multi-stage builds where you build something. Let's say you want to build something from source. So you build, you, you pull all the source code down, you build a package. 
and then you store that package outside the container and then you have a new container that you launch where you then just pull in the package and install the package that you just built in a previous container so these are staged builds um, that's one thing you can do and then there is something very sophisticated that again NeuroDocker does if you look at NeuroDocker, they have a way of minimizing an image so what they do is you can say i want an image that can only run recon all so they go in the image and they trace every everything that gets executed and touched in the image and then they remove everything that hasn't been touched by the process so you end up with a with a hundred megabyte free surfer image that can do recon all and it will run everything that recon all needs but nothing else, which is sometimes exactly what you want on an HPC. So if you look at these minima minimized uh, free surfer images on Eurodocker and see how they do it, it's two elements. So that's yeah. that would be my recommendation. And then if you have a Docker image, that's, so that works with Docker images. And then if you, have, if you minimize Docker image, you simply pull the singularity image and you have it on the HPC. Okay, yeah, that's what I, that's the, uh, I tend to point people in general to Neurodocker and how they do the minimization because then you don't have to think about the details and they just, it's, it's yeah. they've, they've done an awesome job there, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we um, have a new question. Uh, there is one, while creating a new pipeline, is it better to create one container or multiple containers called in a main script? So that is a, an excellent question. And um, I think the answer is probably longer than you're hoping for. Um, but um, it, so, okay, the, the simple, the short answer is it depends, like a lot of things. Um, <laughs> So basically what we do in so the project we presented in the end, Transparent Singularity, the, the aim there is that we have everything, every tool in a little container. And what we do is Transparent Singularity is basically a layer that allows us to combine different containers. And um, the good thing is we can then use NiPipe, for example. So what we do is we install NiPipe on, in, in Miniconda in our HPC, and then we have Transparent Singularity uh, and then this calls into multiple different small containers. The advantage of this is um, I have small containers. I can easily update the containers. And often I try out different things. So I need FSL 6.03 or FSL 6.00. Uh, and sometimes you just want to change the version of things. And this makes it really nice and flexible. Uh, but then when you're done developing a pipeline, I think it does make sense to put all the tools that you needed. For example, uh, so Tom, Tom just uh, published a paper where we released the pipeline in uh, one big container uh, just for reproducibility of the results in the paper. I think this makes a lot of sense. Um, this would not be the container we would then use on an HPC because it's like seven gigabyte, but it is the container that did the paper. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I hope this explained it a bit. And Tom, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I think for that for that specific example, we actually have two containers. We have one container that's specific for reproducing the entire pipeline and re reproducing the results in the paper, which, as you said, is seven gigabytes. And then we have a separate container, which just contains the software that we use, um, which would be useful for actually um, if you wanted to go and use the pipeline somewhere else. So it does, yeah, again, again depend on what you're doing. And I think with fMRI prep, they include every single um, dependency and FN and NiPipe and uh, all of the rest of it. And that is, I think they've got it as minimized as they possibly can, but it is still a very massive image. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big chunky boy, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Just pulling, pulling that one is always a bit of a, a trouble, definitely. Yeah. Um, I have a question, and once again, because I've not watched the video, it's going to be just like, I mean, most likely you already addressed it. Um, containers and MATLAB. Discuss. <laughs> how do you, how do you, how, what's the easy way around? Tom, you or me? Well, uh, <laughs> I'll start and you can add to it because there's always more to say. Uh, so I guess the, 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 the first thing to discuss is um, the MATLAB run. And so um, you can run uh, the MATLAB runtime through um, Docker and Singularity. And uh, so the first way that you can do it is um, through NeuroDocker, which works quite well. Um, and it's very, very simple to install the MATLAB runtime, um, which you can run in the SPM, which is a program that runs through MATLAB. Uh, yep, compiling your MATLAB code and use the RT. Yeah, so you can use the runtime environment um, in order to run things like SPM uh, in Docker or Singularity, and that works quite well. Um, however, there are a few other things that can't be um, done within uh, the runtime environment. So I think, Stefan, you could talk about Octave or what's the other? Uh, 
Yes, exactly. I think a few things are, are hard for users. I mean, the first thing is, I think not everyone can compile MATLAB code because this is a license that not every university has. So I had people hmm. who could not compile stuff. And the reason was that the university didn't purchase <clears> this <throat> plugin. Maybe they'd got something wrong, but that was one thing I saw. Um, so yes, I think Octave is certainly an option. If you're, if you're developing code uh, on the HPC and you want to change things, then Octave is good. And I know, for example, the SPM guys, uh, I think Guillaume is, for example, the chat, he spends, uh, he spent a lot of time on making SPM work in Octave. And the way he did it is he fixed a lot of things in Octave. So if you're using SPM, um, then I think Octave is a really, really good thing to, to use. Um, and I think it will help there. Otherwise, you could, if you really want all the MATLAB thing, you can install it in a container. You can make it work. You put your license file in there. And if, you, if, it can, if the Docker container can see your license server, you can run MATLAB in a container. There is nothing wrong with it, except that you end up with a 16 gigabyte container. Um, <laughs> And then there's the other thing. You could also say, well, okay, maybe, maybe I look at the different languages, right? Of course, that's the that's also another way. You could say maybe Julia is something really cool as well, uh, and and do your start doing things in Julia if you want to run on HPC. It might be not a bad idea at all in the end because you actually might get much better performance than in MATLAB, and it might be just matter, much better suited. But yeah, legacy code is always an issue, so I think it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so you're not you're not saying we should rewrite SPM with Julia, right? I, I I'm not sure if I I think I would love it. I would love to see uh, SPM uh, rewritten in, in Julia, um, and we'll see. Maybe that happens. And um, <laughs> yes, so there's two, two thumbs up for that. Uh, yes, uh, or yeah, but I think it, as of now, I think it runs really well in Octave. So yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, if you're using fancy yeah. uh, object-oriented programming in the newest MATLAB language features, Octave will will just uh, cry and run. Yeah, that's that. Usually, my recommendation is just run things. I tend to like maybe run things on Octave just by default, just to make sure they're not broken. So that you know, that's like my my rule of thumb in general. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe there is a Julia version one day. Who knows? Exactly. Um, there's also another thing. Uh, exactly. MATLAB license and HPC are a big problem. I think we had this problem in Zurich uh, very often. You, you tried something running on a, on a normal day, and you would run out of statistic toolbox licenses. It was just always yeah. problematic. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. They, they updated this so you can actually run it out. So yes, yeah, so on our HPC here, we have actually local licenses that don't have that problem. But OK. Yeah, I've, I don't want to turn that into a, a MATLAB discussion. So if there's yeah. if there are any other conta you more container related it. discussions, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, otherwise we're going to start a war, and we don't want yeah. that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe just a, another topic if, if there are no other questions. So we um, we had the question today: Can I use a container like a virtual machine? Yeah. And hmm. I think the answer is yes. And we actually had an, uh, a, br a brain hack project on this. So it, it's called VNM, the Virtual Neural Machine. And what we did, and it's, it's kind of working, is we're launching a Docker container. And then we, have, uh, we just launch a browser. And then in this browser runs uh, no VNC. So you have VNC in the browser connecting to you to a real desktop session that's running in there with LXDE. And we have all the graphical applications in there running in Singularity containers. So we run Singularity in Docker containers. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. So have a look at the project if you're interested in this. Um, the idea is, again, yes, you could start on your little notebook in this little environment. And then if you're happy, you shift, uh, you shift to an HPC, and you can take this environment with you. So I think there's a lot of potential there. And we're looking for people who would like to contribute to the project. So if anyone is keen on playing with containers, getting their hands uh, dirty, uh, then that's, I think, a perfect project to get started. So we need people building containers, testing containers, uh, building applications for it, integrating things. Um, and yeah, that would be really cool. Um, and I think there's a question, is there something beyond MATLAB and Julia? I, I would say, oh yeah, I think, yeah, C++ is great. So yeah, if you, if you want to spend your day coding and not getting anything done, then I think C++ is awesome. <laughs> and, you get, and you get really fast code, right? There's nothing wrong with yeah. it. I did that yeah. last, the whole last year. And it was, it was a fantastic learning experience. And I really appreciate uh, higher level languages now. <laughs> 
Nice, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, I've posted a link to the once again to the Turing Way uh, book, which uh, is a has a chapter on uh, environments, uh, and it's a, a good overview on um, not just containers, but uh, like virtual machines and this type of things, and how they all relate each other. And in general, the, the Turing book has plenty of good resources, so I highly recommend that in case uh, you're still confused about a few things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we are almost out of time. I have one final question, and it's an animal-related question again. Did you decide to put all the animals after, or after having seen Adina's video with her rabbits in it, or not at all? Or was completely unrelated yes. because now I'm, I'm now I'm starting to think that there's something in the train track this year where like there's a theme. We have to have animal-related content. So I'm like, was yes, that just exactly. by chance? <laughs> exactly. So I saw, so I'm, I'm subscribed to the Dalai channel on YouTube. So I think last week the, a new video popped up and I thought, oh, cool, a new Dalai video. So I, I saw it and I thought, oh, cool, it's for the train track. So we were just building our talks and I thought, okay, uh, their animals are cool. And also we, we thought the talks are quite dry and when we're streaming them, we, we need a break. So we thought yeah. just adding some light things in the middle is, is really, really good. So I just took uh, looked through the a, a few photos I had, so that's why there's a swamp wallaby in there. So I put some Australian nice. uh, animals in there, and uh, also the, the barking owl is a really cool bird. And uh, the first slide is um, is a really cool one. That's a, a tawny frog moth. So it's okay. um, it's also some kind. It's not even an owl, I think. So it's it's a really cool Australian bird. Okay, oh. cool. Okay, so there was there was a connection there. I wasn't sure, but I was like, this is just too just too good to be true to be random. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. And also awesome. the Git talk that we made. I tried to refer to Adina's talk by if you want to get into the rabbit hole of data led and things. I'm not sure if anyone wow. got that reference. We yeah, we don't we didn't get your talk here. So that was oh wow, that wow. was that was that was amazing. Oh no, wait, we did. I don't remember. I'm losing track. What what did we do? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just cause, cause, cause confused by now. Um, but I like how just things were getting cross-linked between each other. It's it's really cool. Um, okay, maybe uh, should we wrap up uh, yes. and introduce the next one? But I'm not sure who. If... Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Oh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, there should be a cross where you can just leave the stage if you want. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for coming. Thanks for traveling halfway no around the world. And, and reach out if you play with containers and you get stuck. Let us know. We're happy to help. Awesome. Bye-bye. Really cool. Ciao. Bye, Ciao. Well, hello, everyone. So I'm joined by Zia and Thomas. Um, do you, am I butcher, butchering your name? How do I actually pronounce it? No, you got it. It's I fine. got it? Nice. Don't have to be all appropriate and pronounce all the accents. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to like fully butcher it. I mean, that happens often, even with my oh, name. You're, you're doing great. Cool, thank she you. is the... Cool. Yeah, but you got um, it. Cool. So yeah, so we have about 15 minutes for people to ask questions about Docker Singularity. Um, be it specific to the session or just any general document singularity questions that you guys might have. And you can use the ask a question feature on podcast. Yeah, there was a question about where they shared the HackMD pages. Mm. I don't know exactly where they linked it. So if we can provide. I'm not sure either. I think that was actually shared. I think that was shared during the APAC hub, um, but I'll find the link. I will find it. Um, yeah, I guess if you want both of you can just like introduce yourselves. Sure. Like, where Tom, you Tom first. Oh, uh, I am a researcher at the uh, Yiddish Russian Zentrum now. It's a bit weird to say because I just finished my PhD at uh, Miguel at the end now with uh, Lisa. Um, and uh, yeah, I work on framework construction for cardiography and reception Uh I'm a PhD student. I'm currently a visiting student at UCSF. My official affiliation is at Cornell. Um, I got dragged into this after the reprinim folks told me Liza needed TAs. So it was very last minute for me. I don't know how prepared I am, but we'll see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, last minute for Thomas as well. I mean, as I, I think I said this several times now. A lot of a lot of this event has ended up being very last minute with the pivot to a virtual event and having to literally just find people all across the world to help us out so 
Yeah. You've done a great job. Thank you very much for Thank all your effort in organizing this. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I guess the two of you haven't met Eduardo before. No. Hi. Hi no. <laughs> nice to meet you. You too. <laughs> Cool. Um, so yeah, I encourage everybody to just ask questions if you guys have any. We will otherwise we will be starting the um, the other session for you. Well, the other session is actually scheduled to start at twelve thirty, so we have a bit of time. Yes. So everyone got that. I guess I'll just say like my experience with Docker and Singularity. Uh, yeah, sure. Like one issue. I see with Singularity, which they're trying to address with their latest release, is the way they deal with environment path. Mm -hmm. Basically, every sing single function you use in a, in a container has uh, a path that points to where it is. Um, with Docker, it controls everything really well. But with Singularity, there's instances where they adapt your native computer's path. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really no way to uh, address that. but um, now they're coming out with a release candidate where they're trying to give you a config file where you can fix some of these issues. It's just something I ran into trying to use these things. Like you and so this goes beyond just like the issue of relative versus absolute pops, because that's something that I have run into with Docker. I guess Singularity as well, where like in the container, I think I, I think when launching a container, I have like made the mistake of specifying like a relative path, and then that has caused many issues. It's not really the, yeah, well, I guess it's two different issues. For mm -hmm. what I'm saying is like the environment path. Okay. Uh, they're just, mm -hmm. yes, Chris. That's, that's um, yeah, so, so the environment itself for Singularity for some reason um, sometimes adapts from your native computer where you build the image. Yeah. Uh, but they're trying to fix that issue now, but it's not currently, you know, officially released, so they're testing it out. Uh, so be careful if you're running to, you know, Path troubles. Just know that they're fixing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions? One sort of like cool use case that I've come across. It's kind of obvious, but it didn't occur right away. But you can do uh, really sort of like massive parallelization on an HPC with uh, Singularity. So if you can find a way to like split up your analysis by subject or within subject, um, instead of running like one Singularity container and having it take like two weeks, you can run like three thousand and. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a lot. It makes it a lot easier to do that. Um, I I'm gonna say one thing quickly because I think Thomas is too humble to brag about this. Uh, Thomas has developed a really cool tool called Apian. It's an automatic head pipeline, button, which yeah, you guys um, can use Singularity or Docker with it. For anybody who does that, I think it's a lot of fmi. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's definitely a much smaller pet community at OHBM, but it's a very new tool. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other issues I've encountered with Singularity or Docker. On, it's, it can be hard to get it to, get Singularity to work on, on OS X. That's a problem I've had with users. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys have run into that problem. Uh, so although in theory, like, Singularity or Docker makes it easy to run on any environment. In practice, if you're trying to create software that's usable anywhere, it can in fact be a bit harder in practice. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a reason you need to do it, it's super easy. Yeah, I, th I think for Mac users, what people, because I, th I think Singularity can only install on Ubuntu or Linux machines. So, so you what, can, yeah, yeah, you could do a virtual machine and stuff. But I think the best thing to do is to just have Docker on your Macs or Windowses, and then build Singularity from the Docker you create, mm -hmm. the Docker image you create, uh, which is what I've been doing. Uh, I just don't want to deal with virtual machines, so. Um, you can just make a Vagrant, which I guess is one of virtual machine on OS X to run Singularity, but it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Yarik is saying that Singularity isn't natively supported anywhere but Linux, and you can use the Docker privilege. Right? Yeah. Or Vagrant. Do we have questions or comments from people who are new to Doctrine Singularity?
Thanks for sharing, Mark. Uh, Claire said, there's a new singularity thingy from Pax, but it's not quite comparable to the Pumpkin version. And there's a Docker Hub image. So oh, yes, I have used Docker to singularity quite a bit. It works pretty well. I haven't really run into too many issues with it. Actually, in fact, yeah, I can say the same. I used, that's what I used for APN, Thomas, when I needed to convert oh, yeah. the Docker image to a singularity container. Yeah, I used Docker to singularity. Um, something else that's good, good to know about Singularity is um, uh, Docker has Docker Hub where you can like upload your uh, images. Uh, but Singularity Hub is quite cool too. I don't know if you can do this on Docker Hub, I haven't tried. But you can set it, you can connect it to your GitHub so that every time you make an update on your GitHub, it'll automatically update the uh, image on Singularity Hub. Uh, and so that can be quite useful if other people are using your software and you want to like keep it up to date. Yeah. That can be um, yeah. Eduardo, do you use either of them? Yeah, I use both as, uh, as well. I mean, I use Docker all the time, then convert the images, then, then I guess what I do is first test everything on Docker. If it works well in my computer, then I mean, with one subject, then I move on to making the image, and then I go to Singularity for the H, uh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the cluster. So. I think I mean most of us are users, but uh, more and more I think you you will have to become a you know a developer if you want to you know have your own small uh, world, as you can say. Yeah. But uh, it's difficult to get in because of that. To having I mean it will be amazing to have Docker in 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 the cluster and then that's it. I mean you don't need anything else, right? Or or Singularity, whatever yeah. is easier. But but then you have to you have to learn both at the same time, which is a bit annoying, <laughs> I would say. Um, I, ha I guess I have a question for you, Don Eduardo. Um, I mean, as a professor, do you find that your students run into any particular issues when trying to learn how to use Docker or Singularity? Oh yes, but uh, <laughs> but I think it's a it's not a, like a really steep curve. I would say that that it makes it makes everything easier in the end because you just have to give the path correctly, yeah. and it should run uh, like that. So right now, for example, there's a so we're working on with a group in McGill actually with Malar Chakavarti, and they they developed this this small uh, uh, tool for for uh, it's like fMRI prep for rats, uh, mm -hmm. similar to that. So it's it has its own Docker, and we're testing it at the moment with rats. It was tested with mice. So at right now it's uh, if we're testing it, we want to use it with our data, and that will make things much much easier because you don't have to really. I mean, one of the issues that I run with students, it's when they want to install things in their own computer. And that, that is always, uh, you know, it happened, you know, it can, it can go really well or really bad or just one thing won't work. So once you have, if you have everything in a Docker image, then everything runs. And I think, I mean, I use MRI to see, we use fMRI prep, and I have my own tutorials for my students to run everything in there. Uh, so you have to really teach them how to use it, but in the end, it, it is, Quite easy to use afterwards. Yeah. Um, in response to Tristan, he just asked if this is where the Malin talk is going to be. Um, I mean, it's in this podcast channel, but we're going to automatically move everyone into a new channel where the content will be streamed. So, same as with the Dolphin Singularity session, it's pre recorded. And so, we're going to have the same thing where we're, we're just using a different software to stream everything, and then there will be another QA session after that as well, which is going to be live. Uh, I was just going to say, we were talking a lot about like, HPC, but I think uh, sort of to what Eduardo was saying, uh, it's also just a good way to like, do all of your analysis on your own computer. Because I've definitely had like nightmare scenarios where like uh, I had code from like two years ago that produced certain results, and then I couldn't produce the results anymore, and it was very stressful. So if I had just done everything in like Docker from the beginning, uh, then Okay, 10 years from now, I could produce the exact same analysis and I've done it And as, as dependencies change, as our software versions change, uh, that's not always good. I mean, I think most people are people going to think that Docker is mostly for, oh, you develop a software or pipeline and then you just implement it for everyone. But I think we should also like try to make sure that people know that you can also do it for your own things, like to run everything from your experiments, like you said, uh, as an open science uh, framework, yeah. which is not, which I think is not obvious at the beginning. Mm. 
yeah, like you said, it's a little bit of investment up front to like spend time to learn it, um, but it'll save you sweat and tears uh, in the future. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So we have 10 more minutes if people have more questions about comments. Yeah, I mean, there is also a help desk channel where you can ping us there, but um, if you'd like a question answered now, go ahead. Am I the only one here that haven't had a haircut in like three months? <laughs> uh, I haven't had one in two months. I, I cut my own hair. hair uh, wow. It's not good. good. <laughs> yeah, I need, I need a, a shape up. <laughs> Are you talking to Gabby? Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't had a haircut in like half a year, but I guess it's different for women. My hair's longer, it's less obvious that we need a haircut, I guess. It's a challenge. Yeah. Um, aren't things in San Fran opening up? Can't you uh, go get a haircut now? Or are you being cautious? Sorry? Sorry. Uh, you said you were in San Francisco? Uh, uh, I'm in New York right now, oh, sorry, actually. I I'm mean, back uh, home, but good. yeah, oh, I think the barber shops open next week. Oh, okay. Monday? Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. That's what like they said phase two is. We'll see. Okay. I just do a man bun or something. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I was surprised the park started reopening in Brooklyn uh like two days yeah. ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what yeah, to say I'm, about that. <laughs> I, I know I mean, like I was walking around and I'm like it's as if coronavirus is completely gone, which it obviously mm -hmm. is not. I mean, I guess most people are outdoors and not like in bars. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, last chance to ask a question, if you have any. Otherwise, we can start early because I think the the nylon is going to be a bit longer, right? Than we expect. Yeah. It. Yeah. If we start early, we'll actually be able to stick to the schedule a bit better. All right. Cool. And that's. Uh, there might be, I mean, so we like save some of the complications about using Singularity and Docker. It's also important, I think, to emphasize that it's actually like pretty easy, pretty straight. I mean, like, it's not super easy, but like, if you, there's a lot of good tutorials online, you can definitely figure it out. Yeah, so it's not, it's not too hard. But people should definitely give it a try if they never had a idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. In that case, thank you, Thomas and Z, for answering thank some questions guys. and talking about your own experience. I will shift everybody over to the next session.